Hello, this is Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar on organic management of spotted wing Drosophila. Today, we are hosting a multi-state research team led by Ash Ziao of the University of Georgia, and the presenters are going to give you an update on the findings of a NIFA OREI research project on different strategies to manage this invasive pests of fruits and berries. We have a lot to cover today, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Ash Ziao of the University of Georgia, who will introduce the webinars. Welcome to the Organic Management of Spotted Wing Drosophila webinar presented by Organic SWD Management Project, uh, sponsored by Organic Agriculture Research and Extension Initiative, a grant from uh, USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Spotted wing Drosophila is an invasive vinegar fly of Asian origin. It was first detected in the mainland US in 2008 and since then has spread throughout United States in all major fruit growing regions, becoming a major threat to fruit production in the United States. Uh, females of this fly have this very unique ovipositor, which is saw-like ovipositor that they use to oviposit in otherwise healthy intact fruit to deposit eggs inside the fruit. Larvae develop inside the fruit uh, into and feed inside the food, causing a lot of damage. The whole cycle of this fly from egg laying to adult emergence uh, can be completed in eight to 10 days at 25 degrees centigrade. It means that it can go through several generations during a, a field season causing a lot of damage. Uh, back in 2014, crop losses due to this fly were estimated to be around $708 million, $18 million, plus additional increased management costs were estimated to be $129 million. A large a multi-regional team of leading researchers came together to develop organic management of this uh, fly. Organic management in particular was challenging because of limited organic, uh, organically approved options. We have this team uh, represented by 11 major land grant universities and USDA scientists, which are located in uh, major fruit producing regions throughout the United States, as you can see here. The goal of this project is to develop and implement systems-based organic SWD management programs that are compatible with the USDA National Organic Program and true to the ethos of organic agriculture. These programs will be based on a foundation of cultural, physical, behavioral, and biological control tactics bolstered by the NOP compliant insecticides when necessary. The specific objectives of this project include evaluating behavioral tactics for organic management of SWD, improving effectiveness and feasibility of cultural strategies for organic management of SWD, incorporating biological control in organic management of SWD, integrating new OMRI approved products into season-long IPM programs for SWD. And lastly, develop an integrated outreach approach to implement organic SWD management strategies and evaluate their economic impact on SWD management programs for uh, stakeholders. Today, we'll give you an update on the work that has been done through this uh, project team. Uh, the presenters include myself, Ash Sayal, I am blueberry entomologist at the University of Georgia, followed by Elena Rhodes, she's a scientist at University of Florida, Gabriela Tad, uh, she's a scientist at Oregon State University, Kent Dana, uh, he's a specialist at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, Steve Van Timmeren, he's a scientist at Michigan State University, Leah English uh, uh, out of uh, University of Arkansas, and Mariano Capanu uh, out of uh, uh, University of Georgia. So with this, I will hand it off to uh, Elena to present objective one on behavioral control. Elena. 
Thank you, Ash. Good afternoon, most of you. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I'm going to be talking about the behavioral tactics aspect of our research. And this has two main components. One is what we've been calling SPLAT. It's now HOOK SWD and actually ACTRA, which I'll be talking about in a second, and then also a food grade gum. So the HOOK and ACTRA SWD I'll be talking about first. I've got a nice picture of the HOOK on a blueberry bush from our field season a couple of years ago. And it actually, the attractant in it is the ATRA SWD, which is an eight or nine component attractant blend that is mixed into this gel matrix. It's actually white. They put that red dye in there because red is has been shown to be attractive to SWD. And then with the hook product, spinosad was mixed into that. That's the active ingredient in Entrust. They've been having issues getting this registered because the attractant has so many components in it. A lot of their products that they have have a pheromone in it as opposed to a food-based attractant like this one. So they've come up with Actra Tayun SWD, which is a four component attractant blend. And this is the one that they're looking to go forward with getting registered. And the idea being that growers will be able to add different insecticides to it as the kill component of the attracting kill. We unfortunately didn't get to do any field work this year. Georgia and Florida were on full lockdown while our blueberry fruit was out in the field. And Rutgers up in New Jersey was on lockdown for a lot longer than we were. So none of us had much of an opportunity in the field. So we did some lab studies this past year. And this is what the setup looked like. We used a little syringe to put precise droplets of the hook or the atra onto the leaves. And it's on this leaf that's unfortunately being blocked by the second one in this container. We had these blueberry shoots that we collected from the field that we stuck in various forms of vials to make sure they had water. This down here in the test tube is a water source so that the SWD had something to drink. And then we put berries in the bottom. In Georgia and Florida, we had to buy these from the store. So we bought organic blueberries from the store. And then I released, or we released uh, 10 SWD, five males and five females. And you can actually see one up here. And for sampling methods, we counted dead flies at one, three and six days after release. And then we collected all those berries in their own separate containers and put them in an environmental chamber and counted the number of adults that we got after 10 to 14 days. In the first experiment, we looked at those different attractants. So the Actra SWG, which has the higher number of components and the Tayun, which has only the four. We looked at those with and without dye and then we added and trust to all of those. And we had the hook product as our positive control. And we also had an untreated control. At UGA, they also did a full year application, but something went wrong with it, as you'll see in the graphs. So this is our graph showing the mortality results from UF. So the different days are the different colors. The blue being 24 hours, red being three days, and purple being six, day, six days. But the main thing is that you can see that when we added in trust, whether there was dye or not, it was as effective as that hook product. We had 80% mortality by 24 hours and then 100 or close to it by three days. The Tayun product actually may have a little bit of mortality in and of itself, so something worth looking into. So having only the four components as opposed to the eight or nine didn't affect it. And at Georgia, they saw the same thing. They have their one, three, and six days in separate graphs, but you can see these are the ones the Entrust was added to. We can see a little bit more effectiveness with the Tayun here, and that just continued over the three and the six days. For emergence data, we got the expected trend, higher emergence where we didn't have the Entrust than compared to where we did. We were expecting to get some emergence with the Entrust because the berries are right there in the container. So it's the ideal 
set up for the flies to be able to lay eggs before they uh, die from being exposed to in trust. And the berries themselves don't have any pesticides on them. And again, we had less emergence from the Atra Tayun plus dye. And uh, from Georgia, they got similar results to what we got with the lower emergence where the entrust was added to the different products. So that was very good news. The Atra Tayun looks like it's just as effective as an attractant as the original formulation. So that was very positive. The second thing that we did is we mixed different pesticides with the atratayun just to compare them in the lab. Essentially, we looked at a lot of different treatments to narrow things down for when we take this out to cage studies and field studies in the future. And we looked at the two different formulations of Grandivo. So the WDG is the old solid formulation. This SC is a new liquid formulation. And then XC is the older venerate formulation and EP is a new one they're working on. Azera, which has neem in it, as well as pyrethrins, the active and pyganic. And then uh, we also looked at pyganic itself because neem can have some repellent properties. Also at Rutgers and UGA, they looked at some conventional products. I've blocked out the names since this is an organic presentation, but you'll still see the little bars in the graphs. So this was Rutgers data. They did theirs first, and unfortunately, they didn't have a water source, so they had high control mortality, and the only product that was really shown to be effective was in trust, because everything else looked like the control of even to six days. So we learned from that and gave them a water source, and I saw some efficacy with Pyganic here at Florida, and also the newer Venerate seemed to have some efficacy. This is the Atra over here, and these were foliar applications just for comparisons. And the only thing I saw efficacy with that was with the Entrust. When I did this, the, the leaves were, we'd had a cold front, and so the leaves were all starting to senesce, to turn brown at that point. So that probably contributed to the low efficacy there. Uh, UGA saw similar things, except that their entrust was not that effective after 24 hours, but it caught up to these four, our conventional products, by the three-day time period. And then at six days, you can see they had some efficacy from Azera and the older formulation of Venerate as compared to the untreated control. With the emergence, we didn't see a lot of differences. The Entrust spray was effective at reducing emergence for Rutgers, and that was it. Not surprisingly, is that kills a little bit faster than when with the attract and kill when you have the berries right there. We didn't see any differences as far as emergence at UF either. And it was very similar with UGA, where only a couple of the conventional products we saw any differences. But that wasn't a huge surprise given the proximity of the berries to the flies in such a small container. We were really just looking to screen these products. So the Atra and the Atra Tayun, with and without dye plus and trust, were as effective as that hook product. And the Atra Tayun was at least as effective as the actor SWD. So that is very good news that that four component blend looks like it's effective. And then it looks like, as far as the organic products, Pyganic and Venerate mixed with that actor Tayun are worth looking into further and also possibly Azera, which has the pyrethrins and the neem in it. So that's the hook actress part that we did. And now I'll talk a little bit about some of the food grade gum stuff. And they were able to do some limited field work towards the end of their season. One of the things they looked at was the effective range over a 21 day period. They had the point sources here and then they collected berries from zero up to 40 feet. And what they found was up to about 30 feet, it's effective and then you really jump in the number of eggs per fruit when you get to 40. So the effective range is somewhere in here between 30 and 40, probably closer to 30. 
This was an experiment where we had, they had an untreated control here of an of an acre in size, a gum treatment here of an acre in size, and then they had a buffer in between that was untreated. It says cherries, but there's a picture of a blueberry field, so can't quite figure that out. But these were the results, whether it was in blueberries or cherries. This solid line is the untreated control, and this dashed one is where the gum was, and so there was less mean eggs per berry in the gum treatment compared to this untreated control. And what's interesting is if you look at the overall data, they sampled from the buffer too, and the gums seem to be extending effects into that buffer. This is another efficacy trial in blackberries in high tunnels where the red is an insecticide plus gum and the blue is an insecticide by itself. And after a week, we still have similar numbers, but when you get to two and three weeks, the numbers of mean eggs for berries really increased where the insecticide was used by itself, whereas where the gum was, the numbers still relatively low. Lastly, this is a blueberry field efficacy trial with gum plus grower standard. So this dashed line here is the grower standard spray program by itself. This was the buffer that was also being sprayed. And then down here along the axis is where the grower standard plus gum is. You can't see it because it's blended into the axis. There were no eggs per berry collected from that treatment. Whereas with the buffer and the grower standard itself, they, they did have some, although that's still way less than one egg per berry. That's still very positive news. The arrows, this is where the gum was applied. These were insecticide applications. These two were spinosad. I'm not sure what that one was. So as far as the gum, the arrestant has about a 21 field 21-day field longevity, at least under California conditions. In wetter places, it might not last as long. It works at levels comparable to pesticide applications. Open field trials at 50 dispensers per acre result in significant reduction in fruit damage. Less efficacy is seen with it under high pressure situations. And we've seen the same thing with the hook attract and kill product as well. When you get really high fly numbers, it's less effective. But it can help to reduce pesticide applications quite significantly, and this in turn can reduce production costs related to SWD control, which is very positive. So that's what we were able to do with behavioral techniques in spite of severe limitations from COVID-19. And with that, I will pass it on to the next person. Oh, hi, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me here. Uh, today, we try to talk about uh, how microclimates contribute to Drosophila Suzuki dispersal and abundance. So, first of all, um, let me see. Okay, here. Yeah, first of all, let me introduce you the uh, concept of uh, what, what do we mean with microclimate. This actually depends largely on the question being addressed. For example, here we can see in this first picture, a uh, nice, beautiful mountain. And for a landscape ecologist, uh, um, the microclimate could be um, the study of uh, one side of this mountain, while for a um, scientist who is focused on the distribution of mosquitoes, his small hole filled with water could be mm -hmm. uh, the microclimate he's interested in. And for us, uh, as entomologists focused on Drosophila Suzuki distribution, the tiny space uh, in between the weed mat and the ground uh, on the soil could be um, the specific microclimate we are interested in. So uh, the definition is, is uh, pretty, you know, uh, it's really well defined by the organism you are talking about, and of course by the, um, the environment. So, <clears throat> in agroecosystem, we know that uh, uh, crop microclimates can contribute to the insect pest distribution and abundance. For example, as we were saying, Drosophila suzuki, which is this invasive coming from invasive species coming from the Southeast Asia, 
uh, we know the temperature as well, humidity or aeration, <clears throat> the canopy distribution are really important parameters uh, which can affect the distribution, the spread, the survival, the fecundity of the species. <clears throat> We have uh, many papers uh, talking about how especially temperature and humidity play a really important role in defining uh, the, <clears throat> the distribution and the survival of the species. Here we just uh, put some of them. Um, we have the first one talking about humidity and how the temperature uh, can, uh, can still uh, um, play a really important role, how the development of Drosophila Suzuki is affected by these parameters. And uh, over the last 10 years, uh, uh, we really published uh, uh, many papers about really, really important papers, which uh, actually help us to better understand how to manage these species out in the field. But uh, today, um, our goal is just not to talk about how temperature uh, influences uh, the dispersal rate and the survival of Drosophila Suzuki, but also how horticulture management uh, can, uh, can help uh, the pest, uh, this pest control. So it seems a, bit, a little bit difficult to explain, but I'll try to, um, to explain uh, uh, in an easier way, okay? So uh, when we talk about horticulture management, uh, our goal is to increase plant performance, right? Uh, but at the same time, what we are seeing out in the field is that um, when, you, when, when you have a good management of your crop, in, um, for example, I just think about how we prune our plants, uh, we can really get benefit uh, in terms of Drosophila Suzuki control. So uh, briefly, we'll talk about uh, how temperature affects Drosophila Suzuki distribution, and then we'll try to define together at the value, uh, the really important value of the data collected by Dr. Dr. Bernadette Strick and then colleagues over the last few years uh, in terms of weed mat and uh, the related benefit and how can we use Drosophila Suzuki data collected out in the field in order to create model, which actually help us to predict the life cycle of Drosophila Suzuki and its distribution. So first of all, let me cite this paper, um, which is actually, let me say I'm pretty proud of. Uh, it does talk about how Drosophila Suzuki is able to move from uh, the surrounding vegetation to the crop on a daily basis. And what is really important uh, is to how temperature and humidity, as we were saying, affect the distribution of the species. Just look at the picture on the uh, right side. Here we can see how there is an inverse correlation between the number of flies collected and the temperature. So higher temperature implies um, lower, lower capture rate, of course, because flies tend not to, to fly when temperatures are above 25 degrees. And uh, <clears throat> in order to connect uh, this concept uh, with the horticulture, um, horticulture topic uh, we're talking about, it's important to cite two more papers. Uh, this one, in which uh, Dr. Megan Waltz and uh, Dr. Gina Lee described how actually uh, you can find a huge number of pupae on, uh, on the soil uh, instead of just into the berries and this this gives us the idea how easily uh, larvae and pupae can uh, jump out of berries and, uh, and um, have the final um, cycle of their life on, on the ground before emerging as, and as adults. And uh, another important paper is this one, uh, published by Dalila Randon and team uh, a few years ago. And what we, what we get from this paper is that across regions, as you can see here, this work has been done in Georgia, Michigan, Oregon, um, because of the high suboptimal sub temperatures uh, occurred on the ground, uh, we had a lower larval survival and a longer period of, uh, of maturation. So this is really important. And here we can connect with the data uh, provided by Dr. Bernadine Streik. So uh, why, why are we talking about this? Uh, the aim of, uh, of the work was to understand how the presence of uh, sawdust or uh, uh, sawdust applied with uh, blackweed uh, mat or greenweed mat in combination could 
affect uh, the um, positively, hopefully affect uh, the, um, the blueberries plant uh, and also the presence of Drosophila suzuki. What she did found is that uh, actually by using different kind of uh, treatments, uh, so you can have a combination of sodas plus uh, black weed mat or green green uh, weed mat uh, or um, you know the combination of the two, two uh, you don't really have uh, a negative effect on your plant, on your yield, uh, on the bricks, uh, firmness of the berries. Uh, there is uh, just a good evaluation of the cost to install uh, in case and you know replace the, the material. There you can see how uh, it can be a little bit different, but over a longer period, uh, it seems that when you apply both sodas plus uh, uh, with MET, uh, you can save money uh, over a longer period. Um, at the same time, as you can see here in this picture, um, Scott Orr um, placed uh, temperature sensors in order to collect, uh, to detect uh, the temperature uh, above the ground and also um, under the, the with MET. Their, their goal was to um, define um, how the temperature, uh, in, an increase actually temperature thanks to the presence of these treatments could affect the, the life uh, and the production of the plants. Here you can see in this graph on the right side, uh, um, the temperature detected in the five uh, treatments included also the ambient temperature, which is a lower compared what, uh, of what we can see um, in, uh, in the treatment. So, um, and now we are trying to collect with the um, uh, models. So, we, we are talking about horticulture uh, practices and benefits. Uh, we are talking about presence of Drosophila Suzuki, but how can we con really connect the two topics? Uh, what can we get? Uh, because of course, one question of ours is, uh, can we affect the survival of Drosophila Suzuki thanks to a higher temperature on the ground? And the answer is yes. Uh, thanks to the collaboration with Dr. Ferdinand Fab, we were able to create uh, uh, this, um, this formula, which is, seems pretty complicated also to me, but uh, you know, uh, he knows uh, um, mathematics. He knows how to uh, how to deal with kind of formulas. And um, the most important point is that when you when you get your data from uh, from the field, I'm talking about number of eggs detected in berries, uh, or it could be the number of flies collecting your in your traps. Uh, you can put this data together, combined with temperature recorded out in the field, in order to see how. Um, uh, a biotic factor can play a role in uh, defining the survival of uh, Drosophila suzuki. I'm not only survival because if you look at this graph, thanks to models, uh, we can define uh, what the, what's about the fecundity. Um, the fecundity, which is actually, uh, I will remember, uh, you're different from uh, fertility, um, is, um, it's good as soon as you reach uh, temperature in between uh, 50 and 20 degrees, but as soon as you start having higher temperature or lower temperature, uh, the number of eggs per day is, uh, is reduced. Maturation time is also affected by temperature. As you can see here, there is an inverse correlation. Higher temperature uh, imply um, uh, lower number of days uh, flies needs to complete the life cycle. And still, uh, we can talk about the probability of maturations, adult life length, uh, and uh, if we would have time, it would be nice to go many others kind of uh, graphs. But um, you know, you can always contact uh, um, me or Dr. Ferdinand Fab, Dr. Von Walt, and, and we can talk about. Uh, but what is important? Uh, what's we really is important here? Oh, sorry, I forgot to use his picture. Sorry, Ferdinand. Yes, uh, what is really important for our perspective is this. So, our question since the beginning was. Uh, is possible to uh, affect, uh, to increase the mortality of Drosophila suzuki um, by using this uh, sodas, not only sodas, but also the other treatment, the combination of sodas plus the weed mat, uh, and it doesn't really matter the color. And the answer is yes. Thanks to the uh, powerful tool, which is the, the, the model, 
we can get this data. Sometimes we originate data, we just run like a mean, average, a few really uh, simple analysis, uh, thanks to which it's possible to start having an idea, but uh, it's really difficult to, uh, to get uh, deeper information. But as soon as you start uh, modeling this kind of data, you can see something like this. Uh, just look at this uh, juvenile mortality per day and how at the highest temperature you can get uh, with the sawdust uh, play a role in, uh, in increased mortality. Here we are talking about uh, more or less 40, 45% more of mortality. So um, what, does, what does I get from this information is that uh, as soon as you start having your treatment in order to protect your, your soil, so you start having sawdust, and uh, with MET, you just not have uh, horticultural benefit, uh, but uh, you can get also uh, benefit in terms of uh, uh, managing Drosophila suzukii. So this uh, uh, picture, this uh, slide is really, really important. And of course, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I can share with you also the other graph we got with, um, uh, with the other treatments, which, which actually are more or less the same with the sawdust. And uh, here, uh, what we get from uh, this graph, is that uh, um, we can see how temperature influences the growth of uh, Drosophila suzuki population. Uh, the blue line tell, tells us that during the season, most of the flies, uh, uh, most of the population is composed by juvenile stages and that they actually tolerate higher temperature compared to adults. So this is really important. And, and uh, you can see in this graph with the temperature is reported in yellow. As soon as you have higher temperature, you have a reduction in an effect, a mortality effect on the, on the, on the population. So everything is relation here. And here again, I just wanted you to underline again how um, temperature is higher um, in the ground when you, when you place your weed mat and sawdust. And this, as we were saying, can affect the the presence of Drosophila suzuki. On the bottom side of this slide, on the right, right side, you can see Drosophila suzuki juvenile density, which is higher, exponentially higher, um, when you consider the ambient temperature and lower uh, when you consider the, uh, the presence of the treatments. So what I get uh, out of all this work is that uh, it's really possible to evaluate uh, at the same time, horticultural benefit and uh, uh, possible good benefits also for Drosophila suzuki managing. In particular, uh, I like thinking that the mathematical models uh, can make us uh, look differently at uh, the environmental system. In particular, uh, they might give a simple answer to the observation that growers uh, make uh, constantly out in the field. And then it's our role just to interpret this data and try to find uh, new data and, uh, and share new knowledge about. So uh, my, um, well, yes, uh, here is the take home messages, how it's important to um, take care of the weed mat uh, plastic and how we can, uh, um, we can get benefits from both of the sides. So thank you and uh, I, let, uh, I let time to another person. Thank you, Gabriella. Okay, I'm going to talk about biological control tactics. My name is Kent Dana with the University of California, Berkeley. And I want to thank my co-authors. I'm presenting their data. Um, and we're going to focus on biological controls. So we're going to talk about um, augmentation uh, first. We'll spend most of this time on augmentation with these two pupil parasitoids. Pachycropoideus and Trichopria. These are already found in North America. Pachycropoideus, sometimes we call it PV, has got a wider geographic range than Trichopria. Uh, both have got a large host range. They don't just attack spotted wing, but a lot of other fly species. Overall, naturally, parasitism is not that high, usually less than 10%. Um, there have been augmentation trials especially with Trichopria, that have shown some impact, both in Europe and Mexico. The other kind of biocontrol is classic biocontrol. I'll spend less time on that today, 
And I'll just show you where we are with the permit to get Gnaspis brasiliensis out of quarantine. So to put augmentation into context with pesticides, we've got the fly increasing in density, economic injury level, and we typically wait until the fruit is susceptible, and then we put on one or more insecticide applications. And this will drive the population of the fly down if you use an effective insecticide. Augmentation works somewhat similarly. You've got a fly population going up, but in augmentation, you typically have to start releases earlier than you would with an insecticide application. So you apply a large number of parasitoids, uh, much higher than you normally would think of because you wanna overwhelm the fly population. Uh, in this case, I'm showing three releases. Typically you have to release more than once. And with augmentation, the idea is that the parasitoids you release do not replicate that often in the environment or if they do, they don't sustain themselves year after year after year. So we'll first talk about work in Minnesota that was led by Mary Rogers and Leah Wirth. They were looking at augmentation of pachycarpoides or PV in raspberries in ex exclusion tunnels. I set this up with replicated, fully replicated experiment. In 2019, uh, in these, you can see in the lower right, uh, the artificial tunnel. Uh, in 2019, they were looking at 500 PV per week. They artificially infested the tunnels with Spotted and Drosophila. So they got it up to about 50% infestation before they released the parasitoids. In 2020, it was the same setup, but they had two treatments compared to a control, a 500 PV release and a 1000 PV release per week. Uh, a standard data collection, they subsampled within these uh, tunnels. They looked at uh, fruit infestation and they put out sentinel dishes with spotted wing pupa to look at percent parasitism. We see 2019 and 2020 data here. Um, we've got the arrows showing the release dates, both in 2019 and 2020. And in the blue, orange, and yellow lines, we're seeing the no parasitoids, 500 parasitoids per week, or 1,000 parasitoids per week. What we see is there's not very much difference between the releases and the control. And in fact, in 2019, they released, reached about 6% parasitism with 500 PV released. And in 2020, they, released, they got to about 15% and 20% parasitism with the lower and higher release rates. In Oregon, Jana Lee did a similar project looking at uh, caneberry and hoop houses. Uh, she also released into wild blackberry border plant plantings uh, nearby. Uh, she released far lower numbers, about 20 to 50 PV per week, but she also used this augmentorium box. The idea, and you look at the lower right, is that you've got a, a box with host plant material in it, fruit, in which the spotted wing increases in density. You either let the PV or the parasites come in or you add it, they increase in numbers, and then they leave and go back out into the field to lower the pest population. Um, in 2020, she also included the releases of uh, mustard of forex, which is a pupil ectoparasitoid used for livestock uh, control for the livestock filth fly. Uh, and previous researchers have reported about a 40% reduction in spotted wing by releasing this uh, parasitoid. Same kind of data collection. Um, you can see the, the plots there, the design there. She looked at sentinel, spotted wing drosophila. Uh, she also looked at spotted wing in collected fruit and spotted wing adults in traps. Uh, and I'm just gonna show the summary table here from sentinel parasitism uh, in the hoop house, she got slightly higher parasitism rates with the releases, 47% versus 30% in the 2019 study when she's only releasing PV. In the Blackberry borders, it wasn't significant, but it was 44% versus 
versus 31%, 44% in the release treatment. Uh, in 2019, there was no difference in spotting the larva in fruit or in adults in traps. In 2020, when she was releasing both PV and mustard of forex, she got no significant difference between the release treatment and the control treatment. So I'm also gonna go on next to work that was done in California, but to highlight that work, um, I'm going to highlight the work we did in increasing uh, methodology, improving methodologies to uh, rear out PV and TD. Uh, typically we're rearing these things in the organ cages. When we started this work, we were using a auger diet to rear spotted wing or um, the standard vinegar fly melanogaster. Uh, we would then go into these cages, and if this movie starts, no, nope. uh, we would use an aspirator to basically collect the adults and then give that to Brian for field releases. This led to a lot of mortality because we were collecting adults, we didn't know their age, we were shipping adults, um, they were dying in transportation, dying in shipment. So one of the things we did to improve in augmentation was to improve our rearing methodology. We went to a dry diet um, and we also were able to separate out the pupa from the diet. So we could deliver to the parasitoids um, only pupa, Spotomum drosophila or Melanogaster. And you can see in that Petri dish, each dish would get to about 2,000 to 5,000 parasitoids each. This also allowed us to ship to Brian in the field. Instead of shipping adults, we could ship parasitized pupa, knowing that there were no adult spotting when they were going to come out because they had already emerged. So he would get parasitized pupa, knowing that in two or three days, the adult parasitoid would come out. Uh, that allowed us to control the release much, much better. And in fact, we also added another improvement to this. We found that we could freeze the pupa before exposing it to the parasitoid, and that allowed us to store the flies a little bit longer and control our production so that when needed, we could expose more flies and that means three weeks later, we would have a better idea of how many parasitoids we could deliver to Brian. And that's just showing the trial, ongoing trial right there. Um, so in 2019, Brian was releasing about 60,000 PV and TD in releases of about 1,500 to 16,000 per release. In 2020, we focused only on PV where he's releasing about 5,000 to 10,000 per site every one to two weeks from August to October. Uh, the 2019 design is shown in the top left where he's releasing at one site in hoop houses and we've got controls uh, at a distance away. In 2020, we had uh, controls at a greater distance away and similar to the other studies we were using Sentinel traps, and we are looking at adult populations. Also collecting fruit and looking at percent parasitism in the fruit. And I want to point out in 2020, we were close to this riparian zone area that had a lot of spot and wing uh, host flies uh, in this area. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later in the talk. So uh, I'm only going to show 2020 results. Uh, first is the parasitism increased after the release from about 0% um, the years before with PV to about 15 to 65%. Second, there was a shift in parasitism from TD to PV. Uh, normally in the past, he was getting up to about 12 to 15% parasitism with TD and less than 1% to PV. So there was this shift with increased parasitism and it was mostly the pachycropoides. Next, there was higher parasitism with higher re release rates, and we see that in the graph that I'm showing here. But surprisingly, there was no difference between the release and the control. And you can see that here with the open circles being the control, closed circles being the release. We suspect that PV got into the riparian zone, 
and multiplied, just like Jaina's augmentorium boxes, multiplied in the riparian zone and was going into the hoop houses and into our plots. So what I'm gonna do to conclude with this is to talk briefly about classic biocontrol. Uh, classic biocontrol is different than the augmentation in that the idea is that you're releasing a fairly low number of the imported parasitoid into the environment. It's gonna build up numbers and go into an oscillation uh, in density with the fly population, but hopefully bring the fly population down below the economic injury level. And it should be sustainable year after year in a successful classic biocontrol project. So I've reviewed this in the past. This was a collaborative effort uh, by myself at, based at UC Berkeley with members at Oregon State, members at the USDA, members in Cabe, Switzerland, and in Italy. And we we're focusing our collections in South Korea and China. Um, we found three parasitoid species were important, Gnaspis brasiliensis, Leptopolina japonica, and Asobara uh, japonica. The foreign explorations went from about 2013 to 2018. Uh, I wanna point out we were averaging about 20% parasitism at these sites, but we had up to 76% parasitism at some sites in China. We conducted quarantine studies from about 2014 to 2018. These are required to get this material out of quarantine and releasing it in the United States. We're still doing taxonomic studies. Uh, we want to make sure that we understand the populations of Gnaspis brasiliensis which is the uh, parasitoid species that we submitted a USDA petition for. So with this quarantine work, um, we try to show that there's little risk to releasing these imported parasitoids and great benefit. So the petition itself causes the start of a federal action that's really looking at two different acts, the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Protect Policy Act. Both of these address risk. We've gone from 30, 40 years ago, looking at focusing on the benefit of the imported natural enemy to focusing these days on a risk aversion policy. So we wanna make sure that they can do a lot of benefit, but have very little risk to anything else. So our petition addressed seven different required components, including underlined their host specificity testing to make sure that the imported parasitoid will not attack anything else or will not dramatically change the density of any other fly species already here in the United States. Um, the petition was submitted in 2019, it went to uh, NAPO, which is North American Plant Protection Organization. It was approved. Uh, it went forward uh, past the Endangered Species Act concerns. Uh, it now moved into and got passed through tribal consultation. And currently it's waiting publication in the Federal Registry for public comment. Uh, the last process should go fairly quickly. And so we expect to get material out of quarantine by about August 2021. What we'll do then, uh, we've got material right now in California quarantine and USDA quarantine in Delaware. Uh, we could release from those quarantines, but that would not be very efficient. We're going to develop regional quarantines throughout the United States. Well, they will help us mass produce the Gnaspis brasiliensis and release in their region. We also note that Gnaspis brasiliensis has been found in British Columbia, uh, in Canada, as well as a second species, Leptopolina japonica, found in British Columbia, as well as Washington. So we're going to uh, work with colleagues there as well to try to bring that Gnaspis into quarantine and then mass distribute that as well. Uh, so in summary, uh, our augmentation trials showed some increased parasitism in some cases, but no economically important differences in spotted wing numbers, fruit infestation, or percent parasitism. 
Uh, we're still in an experimental phase. It's not yet commercially available in the US and it's still got undetermined cost or benefits. So we're going to continue some of these studies in California next year uh, to look into uh, benefits and costs for augmentation. For the classic biocontrol, we submitted a petition to release Ganaspis brasiliensis. It's in its final phases. We hope to have it out of quarantine in 2021, begin development of regional insectaries to mass produce this and begin releases in 2022. So with that, I'll pass this on to the next speaker. And as we're moving this on, uh, there are three review articles that have come out that you can contact us and we'll send those mater that material to you. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to be talking about the work we've been doing with objective four. Um, so this is some of the work we've been doing, looking at some of the additional products that might be used um, and integrated into some of the uh, control programs that organic producers are using. So I'm going to go over some of the work we've been doing with some of the sterilant products um, that we've been studying, as well as some work with some of the um, uh, skin thickeners. And then I will also be giving an update on some of the work with the resistance monitoring that we've been doing. So first, uh, um, some of the work we've been doing with the sterilant products. Um, we've been conducting studies with sterilant products that contain uh, two active ingredients, the peroxyacetic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And most of the formulations that we use have right around 25% of that peroxyacetic acid and two to 15% of the hydrogen peroxide. And there are several uh, commercially available products, including jet egg, oxidate, rendition, and sporequel. And the important thing to, to note here with these products is that they're active against microbes. And so they're very often used in post-harvest sanitation situations, such as the processing shed. Um, and they're able to kill a bunch of microbes. Um, usually the peroxyacetic acid is a bit more active than the hydrogen peroxide, but they both do have active activity against microbes. And one big advantage of, the, of these products is that once the liquid dries, um, it doesn't leave any residue. So there's no residue left behind. So it's really a really useful tool to be able to use. Um, an important thing to note is that spiderwing drosophila larvae need yeast species to develop properly. So when they're in the fruit, they need yeasts um, to be able to uh, effectively grow to an adult to adulthood. And so we were interested in these fruit sterilant products to be able to control yeasts on the fruit to potentially be able to control spiderwing drosophila infestation. So we've conducted some um, laboratory and small plot trials in blackberry and blueberry um, to test these products. So first I'm gonna show some of the work that was done in the University of Maryland. And in this, uh, this, in this particular study they had in, did in the laboratory and what they did is they sterilized some blackberries and then they dipped them in a yeast suspension. And then they subsequently dipped those berries into either jet egg, which is one of those sterilant products or water. And then what they did is they washed those fruit off and then that liquid, then they, they put that liquid onto an agar plate like this, uh, this purple plate here. And then this is basically filled with food that the yeast can grow on. These little white dots are some of these yeast colonies that are starting to form. Um, and so what they found is that the yeast abundance in the jet egg treated berries was significantly lower. So on, here on the y-axis, this is the yeast abundance, the colony forming units per gram of fruit. And these blue bars are those water treated berries and the green bars are the jet egg treated berries. So these are three different yeast species and all three of them, the jet egg wipe out quite a few of them. So in the laboratory, the, the jet egg was able to kill these yeast species quite well. Um, so University of Maryland, they also did a small plot trial in, in the blackberry planting they have. And in this they did is they applied jet egg once a week for three weeks to these small plots and then they sampled the fruit um, for spider wing drosophila larvae and then also they looked at yeast abundance and they did that once a week. So what we see here on this graph, the y-axis is the number of drosophila larvae per gram of fruit. And then here on this x-axis, you see these are the days after, after the initial jet egg application. And what we see is, is at the zero day we have we have this. We have a jet, jet egg application here. We have a jet, jet egg application at seven days, and then a jet egg application at fourteen days. 
and then there was no application at um, uh, 21 days. And so these two lines are basically about the same. Um, so there was no significant effect of the jet egg on infestation in the fruit. Now, when we look at the yeasts, these are, this is the yeast um, abundance. So these are the number of yeast species that are present on the fruit. And here what we see is this, there was a slight decrease in the jet egg treated um, plots. So the jet egg was reducing some of the, the yeast species, but then after those applications ended, we see an increase in the yeast species. So those, the, those yeast species seem to have come back after that. And um, what we, what this is an important thing to note because there's no residual activity with a fruit sterile product like this. You spray it and you kill what's there, but these yeast species are able to um, grow back fairly quickly. Now, switching to a, um, a small plot trial that we uh, conducted in uh, Blueberry in Michigan. And in this trial, what we have is we have applied one of four sterile products once a week when the fruit were ripe. And then we sampled for SW larvae once a week as well. And so here we tested three different products. You can see we tested jet egg oxidate 2.0 and then also spore quill. And then we have the entrust as well. And on the y-axis again is the average number of Drosophila larvae per gram of fruit. And we have the untreated plot. And then we also have these, all three of these um, sterile products reduced the SWD infestation in the fruit as well as the entrust. So all of these products do seem to have an effect on SWD infestation in the fruit. And these results are consistent with what we found in previous years. Um, and those, uh, those results are published in a previous paper. Um, it's important to note that all of these results are small plot trial data and aren't um, data from commercial applications. So we also did some work with skin thickeners and there are several commercial products, including things like Osmopro, Profuse, Cell Matrix, and Silkel, and there's probably more. And these products will either thicken the skin or cause the skin to be tougher of the fruit. And they're generally used to increase the fruit quality, such as decreasing cracking of the fruit, that kind of thing. And in this product, in this trial, um, this was done in blueberries in Michigan, and we tested Profuse, and these applications were applied when the fruit were ripe. They were applied once a week when the fruit were ripe, and then the SWD larvae were sampled once a week. And it's important to note that these applications went on during at the ripe fruit, ripe fruit timing. Um, usually these products are applied a little bit earlier, like early, late green fruit, but we were specifically focused on testing these with regards to spotting Drosophila. So what we here, see here on this graph, this is one week in the week in that trial. And these are the average number of larvae per gram of fruit again. And we had Profuse once a week. And also here on the, the far right of this graph, we also tested Profuse sprayed every two weeks. And then we had the Profuse plus Entrust and then the Entrust alone. And what you can see is the Profuse and the Entrust treatments all um, decreased the infestation significantly. However, this Profuse every two weeks wasn't as effective. And we, and we also saw that if you applied the, the Profuse at an early or late green timing, you don't see as good of an effect either. So um, this is promising, um, but again, these are small plot trial data and um, the, a similar trial was run in Georgia, the small plot trial and had similar results, but again, these are not commercial, um, commercial trials. Now I wanna switch gears here to some of the resistance testing that um, has been going on recently. Um, we've been using a scintillation vial um, method that has been developed over the last several years. And this is a, a quick and easy method to use to screen different populations of spotwing drosophila for resistance. And what, we've, what we use is we use a diagnostic dose of spinosad, so entrust either an LC99 times two or an LC90 times eight um, concentration. And basically what this is, is the LC90 value is the, is the concentration at which 90% of the flies die, and then we multiply that times eight. And the idea here is that in a, re, in a susceptible population, all the flies are gonna die. Whereas in a resistant population, you're gonna have some flies surviving. So it's an easy way to tell whether you have some resistance developing. And in this method, all we do is we take a small glass scintillation vial. We put that diagnostic dose, a little bit of that liquid in this vial, we coat it. And then we, and then we basically swirl it around. And then we dump out that insecticide. 
And then what we do is we let that dry. And then we add flies to that vial and then we come back eight hours later and we count the number of flies that are alive or dead in that vial. And so in California, they ran these. Um, first of all, I'm gonna show some data from caneberries. And what they did is they um, tested four commercial sites and they tested one susceptible site. And they did this three times during the season and they used this LC99 times two dose, which is basically it's on 927 parts per million. And what we see here is they, they test, tested it three times during the season. And so at these conventional sites, they're spraying in trust through the season. And so you see these three bars are the testing early, middle, and, and late season. And if you just take a, a bird's eye view of this graph with these conventional sites, I want you to see that all of these sites are already at the beginning of the season, starting at about 60% um, of, the, of the flies are dead. So 40% of those flies are surviving. We would expect 100% of those flies to, to be to dead. And at the, the susceptible site, you do see 100% of the flies that is a lot are dead, except for later in the season. And at these commercial sites, you're also seeing a decrease in susceptibility over time, over the season, as more in trust applications are sprayed. So this gives us an indication that there is resistance at these sites and that those in trust applications during the season are basically selecting for resistant flies. Now in California, they also tested at, in strawberry fields. And again, they tested four commercial sites at this 927 parts per million dose. And again, what we see is uh, uh, basically all four of these sites, about 50% of the flies are, are surviving. And so this is an indication that you have resistance at these strawberry sites too. At these sites, they also did some dose response work. And basically what dose response work is, is you basically test more concentrations and to give yourself an idea of how much insecticide will it take to kill these flies. And so this dashed line is that diagnostic dose that they tested initially. And you can see all the way up here, it's close to 10,000 parts per million um, that there's still um, flies alive at that concentrations. If it were a susceptible population, we would expect 100% mortality by, by the time we get to this dashed line. So that's an indication that there is resistance to, that has developed in these populations um, and that they're, these flies are able to survive higher uh, doses of the insecticide than they, than they would if they were susceptible. Now we were able to do uh, testing uh, for Entrust in other regions of the country. And these were also done at commercial farms and then also some on sprayed sites. And at these different areas, we tested in 847 parts per million dose. And uh, I, just put up a lot of uh, data here, but I just wanna show this Georgia data here. If you look here, pretty much everything was at 100% mortality. So that gives us an indication that there doesn't seem to be any um, resistance that's developing here in Georgia. Again, Michigan, a lot of different sites were tested. All of these have pretty much 100% mortality. There's one site that did show a little bit lower uh, mortality. However, that was uh, the first run. And then the, when, the, when those flies were subsequently retested, they had 100% mortality. So that's just some um, natural variability in the experiment. And then finally, with your uh, testing in Oregon, this is uh, testing at one farm population. If we look at these two bars here on the right, this blue bar is, is flies that were tested from an unsprayed population. And the right bar is flies that were tested from a farm population. And you can see there's a, a slight decrease in the percent mortality. So these flies at the farm population were at about 85% mortality. Um, if you recall the California data, you, the mortality was down by 50%. So we would expect 100% mortality. However, um, so it's not quite fully resistant, at least at this site, but you are seeing reduced susceptibility um, here at this site. So just to quickly summarize um, with the fruit sterilants, we did find that the fruit sterilants were effective against yeasts in the laboratory. Um, and we, were, we did see reduced uh, infestation in the fruit in the blueberry trial, but not the blackberry trials. And then we also saw uh, reduced infestation um, in using skin thickener products in the blueberries. And I want to point out that these were small plot trials. So um, the commercial scale, we don't know how effective they may be. And it's also important to point out that 
these products have other uses besides specifically targeting spotted and drosophila. So the sterilants can be used to try to control post-harvest rots and the skin thickeners can be utilized for fruit quality. So there are, are other purposes for these products, but they, there may be some benefit with spotted wing drosophila as well. And then we did have resistance that was detected in uh, both caneberries and strawberries in California and some reduced susceptibility in Oregon, but no evidence for any resistance in other regions, including Michigan and Georgia. And I didn't show the data, but um, Maine also did some testing and there was no indication for resistance. And there is also another trial as part of this uh, objective, looking at pruning regime and insecticides that, that the data from that trial are still in the process of being analyzed. Um, and so those data will probably be shown later at a different date. So that's it for objective four. Hi, um, I'm Leah English and I work with Dr. Jenny Pop at the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture Center for Agricultural and Rural Sustainability. Um, for this project, our team is focused on the economic side of SWD control. So basically, we're trying to bridge the gap between um, what the researchers are finding in their lab and field experiments with the overall economic outcomes that growers may expect as they implement these strategies. And to do this, uh, we are collecting data from the research teams and using those data to try and identify the most economically viable control solutions. Um, once we're able to determine which control solutions are feasible for growers, we'll be incorporating them into a budgeting tool that growers can use to determine which options uh, may be best for their own farm situations. Um, to give an example of what we've been working on, um, we've been working with the team from University of Maryland um, to collect data from their trellis studies. And so here are the primary questions we're focusing on are, um, how much is this gonna cost? If a farmer were going to implement this strategy on this farm, are there gonna be any additional costs that they're gonna have to think about and how might this affect their revenues? Um, so in addition to the information that the Maryland team provided regarding you know, infestation and other characteristics, um, they also provided us information on uh, materials and labors that were used in constructing their trellis um, so we can estimate what the construction cost might be for building one of these trellis systems. Um, and outside of the initial cost of installing it, we also want to think about um, what operational costs growers may expect if they were using this. Is this the same as a traditional trellis? Is there going to be any additional cost or labor that they may expect? Um, and so this, uh, yeah, the primary costs were labor and any costs that they may have to maintain the trellis, changing the wire, things like that. Um, and in terms of labor, I thought it was interesting that they noticed that it seemed like the shape of the trellis um, made it possibly a little bit easier to harvest the berries. And so throughout the season, they were noting the time that it took to harvest the berries through the different trellises. Um, so one thing we'll be analyzing is, you know, whether the use of this trellis may actually reduce some labor costs if it um, kind of reduced some of their time to harvest. Um, they also provided us with data on yields um, so that we can make some estimations on the revenue side of using this trellis. And so using this type of information collected from the research teams, um, we'll be estimating the net economic outcome for the implementation of the various SWD control strategies. Um, so for example, with the cost and yield data provided with the Maryland team, um, we can estimate things like the break-even point for installing um, the trellis. And then we'll also be performing some sensitivity analysis to analyze how profits or losses to farmers may change. For instance, if the yield goes up or if costs go down, how might that change their overall profit? for the farmers so they can kind of um, so we can look at kind of what changes may happen if what we expect to happen doesn't happen. Um, so our ultimate goal out of all this is to use the information to provide a resource that will allow growers to compare SWD control options based on their individual situations and to help them with future planning for their farms as they deal with SWD in the future. So about a decade ago, um, our team developed some budgeting tools um, specific for Arkansas berry growers. So we developed a blackberry, raspberry, and blueberry budget. Um, and as part of this project, we 
have been working to update, update these tools and to try to expand them beyond just use in Arkansas. Um, so as part of that process, we've been collecting production budgets and cost information from all over the country um, so that we can incorporate um, production costs and price differences across regions in the budget. So we want to try to make the budgets um, a little bit more region specific so um, you know farmers across different regions can find use in these as well. Um, and as we collect data from the research teams, in addition to just um, differences across regions, um, we also want to start incorporating some any information um, that might be relevant for practices for controlling SWD in the budget. So if the researchers find that a um, certain practice is useful, we'll incorporate that in. Or if they find that there are certain pesticides or weed mats or things like that that are useful, we'll be incorporating those things into the budget. Um, and as we work on this, we really want to focus on usability and value for growers. Um, so when we had our original budgets, that was one thing. Um, it was kind of a test, you know, we, we would go and get feedback from growers, you know, did you find this easy to use? And so that's, we want to focus on that here as well. Um, we want to make sure that these budgets are easy to use and understand. Um, and we want to make sure that we're providing a value for growers with this budget. And our hope is that growers can find it useful for planning, especially you know, as they think about SWD control in the future and, um, you know, allow them something that they can put together with financial information. So if they want to go um, get a loan from a bank or something, they can use this information that they get from our budgets to help them possibly obtain access to funding and things like that. Um, when updating our older budgets, uh, the way they were set up, we found them somewhat difficult to update. And so for these budgets, another thing that we're focusing on is we want to make sure that updating them is easy. And the reason we want to do this is because we hope that they can be updated periodically and that they can be used beyond the scope of this project. And we don't just want to develop these budgets and have them, you know, kind of sitting there and, and not have anything go forward with them. We want to make sure that um, these budgets can be used for the long term. And so I know that's kind of short, but that's just kind of a breakdown of our goals right now and some of the things that we've been working on um, on this part of the project. So now I'm just going to turn it over to Mariano. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mariano Dosukpanu, and I'm a research associate working under Dr. KKC. So I will share with you uh, what is the evaluation team duties and what we already did and what we are currently doing as evaluation work. So first, the evaluation team is uh, monitoring and evaluating the SWD grants. And the two main, okay. So I said, strategically, we are uh, working to, to help improve the project implementation by uh, capturing what is going on as activities uh, such as lab works, such as uh, field, field demonstrations and so on. So uh, second, our work, evaluation work is useful for accountability for both the federal government and the taxpayers. Uh, next, we are evaluating for technical reasons. Uh, we mainly seek to capture and report the uh, overall impact of the project. So we focused on studying the social impact of the SWD project with the aim to uh, find evidence to prove that uh, the project fostered the generation of berry and cherry growers networks and uh, the SWD researchers network as well. Uh, so we, we also aim to, to collect and present evidence of the biological impacts of uh, by investigating berry and cherry growers experiences in applying the best management practices to control the SWD. So uh, during uh, these last two years of the project, uh, we mainly set the basis of our evaluation work by designing uh, an evaluation plan, by constructing uh, the evaluation instruments such as, uh, such as um, observation protocols, uh, interview guides and questionnaire 
and uh, we mainly attend also uh, all the um, the monthly web meetings. We attended the webinars and conferences, and we collect from these uh, events some factual data. So during the year 2020, we reported the formative evaluation, and we published a peer review article uh, that focus, focused on um, uh, analyzing the collaboration patterns of the SWD researchers network. So there's two uh, main outcomes of our evaluation work can be found uh, through the links we added to our slides. So for this year, 2021, which is uh, the last year of the grant, we are conducting the summative evaluation. Uh, basically, summative evaluation uh, occurred during the last year of a project of a, or a program. So uh, through the, this evaluation, this summative evaluation, we aim to, to value the differences uh, that you researchers made through your efforts. Uh, we also intend to, to reveal the changes that occurred uh, in knowledge and practices uh, as a result of the project. And uh, lastly, we want to investigate and reveal how uh, the project has impacted lives. So to that end, we already launched a, a satisfaction survey, uh, which in, that include four sections. And this satisfaction survey is dedicated to growers. So the first session of this satisfaction survey uh, currently asks four questions to learn more about the uh, respondent profile. But the survey is completely anonymous. We are not asking about uh, respondent's name. And uh, the second session of the satisfaction survey uh, includes six questions that focus on SWD management practices. And the third section of our satisfaction survey includes nine questions that focus on the impact and effectivity of uh, the manage management practices. I would like to mention that uh, all these questions are choice questions, but we uh, designed for the last session, for the last session we offer an open boss. And this open boss gave, uh, gave uh, opportunity to the respondent to provide us with uh, his overall satisfaction, like an other satisfaction we didn't ask during, um, among the question, uh, the quantitative, the close-ended question. So actually, the satisfaction survey can be completed in 15 minutes maximum. And so far, we have um, 50 records of which only uh, 35 are valid um, because we have 50, 15 uh, empty records. And um, among the 35, we have 22 fully completed report, uh, records. So we are inviting growers to continue completing the survey. And the link to access uh, to that and complete that survey is still active. And we included this link also in our slides. Uh, our next step, the next steps of our journey uh, to report the summative evaluation includes also a 30 minute interview. We, and we targeted all of you, growers, uh, advisory members, uh, and researchers. So we will send out an invitation email but uh, you can also volunteer to participate and share your experience with us. So if you are volunteer to, uh, to participate, uh, thank you to reach out by sending an email to us or by directing uh, the direct message uh, us by using the address um, you can uh, find in that slide. So thank you for listening. Among the, just to summarize, uh, among the new behavioral technologies, uh, Hook SWD, Actra, and Actra Tune, when mixed with and trust, have shown some promise. 
these technologies were tested in the lab and have shown efficacy, field trials will be conducted this year. And if effective, they can be used as a tract and kill system to reduce SWD infestation. Another new technology that Von Walton's group developed out of Oregon State, food grade gum. It also showed promise in reducing SWD fruit infestation for up to 21 days, which is significant. Field trials at 50 dispensers per acre significantly reduced fruit infestation. These new technologies can be very effective at lower SWD population densities, which makes them really good, useful tool especially in earlier uh, part of the season when SWD populations are lower. Among uh, cultural uh, control strategies, using black weed mat reduces SWD survivorship and fruit infestation. Uh, heavy pruning also increases temperature and decreases humidity in the canopy, which leads to lower SWD fruit infestation. If installed appropriately, physical exclusion is shown in other studies not presented today uh, under this project uh, also showed that physical exclusion using mesh netting less than one millimeter can provide up to 100% control of SWD in some systems. Uh, in biological control, augmentation of native parasitoid showed increased parasitism but not effective in reducing SWD numbers or fruit infestation. Uh, exotic parasitoids have uh, shown uh, more promise in initial lab studies. Uh, once USDA APHIS petition is uh, complete, uh, fully approved, and they will be evaluated and released in the field, and hopefully that will lead to improved biological control uh, as well. In uh, chemical control, and trust remains the most effective option for organic SWD control and other materials, including Grandivo, Pyganic, and Azira, uh, can be used in rotations can, and should be used because of the resistance management issues. Resistance to SWD, uh, resistance to and trust has already been documented in California. Uh, while there is no evidence of resistance in other regions, all regions should continue to monitor uh, SWD populations for resistance so they can be detect so it can be detected earlier on before it becomes a major issue and management uh, uh, management strategies can be implemented uh, crop sterilants such as jet egg and oxidate were effective in reducing SWD fruit infestation in blueberries but not in blackberries also, our more recent studies show that new skin thickener products uh, reduced uh, SWD infestation in blueberries. These are additional products that can help with SWD as well as if we do other uh, functions they do in, 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 in uh, food production. When it uh, comes to economic analysis and evaluation, region and crop specific interactive uh, budgets are being developed to assist organic berry growers in making economic decisions regarding SWD management options. Uh, this being our uh, last year of the project, summative impact evaluation surveys are underway. Please fill out the online surveys uh, using the links that Mariana showed or contact evaluation team members to share your experiences of organic SWD management in a short virtual interview with that team. In, due to pandemic, while our in-person extension activities to disseminate information and share that all of the information generated in this project with the stakeholders were affected, we uh, immediately switched to virtual meetings in our states and regions to continue disseminating information as uh, it relates to management of SWD. And we have had several meetings in uh, addition to this webinar, uh, all virtual to disseminate information. Additionally, we have developed several online resources that have very helpful information related to SWD management. These websites are hosted by several uh, organizations, universities, and regional IPM centers, and other uh, agencies. With that, I would like to thank uh, USDA NIFA, 
uh, OREI program for providing funding as well as some other uh, agencies that provided additional funding to uh, complete this uh, multiple aspects of this uh, project. With that, uh, I would like to thank each and every one of you for taking time to join us. Please, if you can, uh, take a, a short time to fill out this survey. This will be very helpful for us to gauge the impact of this uh, project and submit uh, evaluation report for this project. With that, I will open the floor for any questions you may have. All presenters are staying uh, uh, online to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we first had a question about the gum. What Can you say what type of gum was used? Is it guar gum that um, was affecting? Well, uh, actually we cannot disclose the, any component of this gum. Uh, it just, uh, we can say it is a food grade gum. It's been that uh, all the ingredients are plant, uh, plant materials. And, um, and yeah, so for this reason, we, we are we are happy about this product, this technology, because uh, we were able to identify out in the field specific uh, uh, plant ingredients, uh, which actually uh, attract uh, Drosophila Suzuki. And uh, by mixing together this blend of uh, volatiles, uh, we are able to reduce uh, to, to reduce the impact on, on berries because uh, flies spend more time uh, on this uh, substrate. So instead of going and lay eggs uh, inside uh, real berries, uh, prefer spending time on this substrate uh, and, um, and also uh, later eggs inside. So later there is a natural uh, uh, process thanks to which because the, the hydration of the substrate uh, eggs uh, are killed by. So, you know, there is an infestation in the gum, but you don't get any emerged flies from it. So yes, uh, unfortunately we cannot disclose any, any component of the, of the uh, technology, but uh, just it's important that you know that it's just a plant-based material and without any uh, toxicity um, implied. Okay, um, let's see. Is there any research involving economics regarding ACTRA's use of interest and um, SWD's resistance to interest? So ACTRA doesn't have interest in it. It's just the attractant mixed in with the gel matrix and any insecticide can be mixed in with it. Once they get the ACTRA tayun registered, it'll come with a label that will have instructions on how to, on what amounts of product to mix with it. You know, like a, a VV, a volume for volume ratio, like you would see with uh, an adjuvant or something like that, that you are adding to a pesticide. Um, so you wouldn't, you don't, wouldn't necessarily have to use in trust. That's why we're looking to see if there are other organic insecticides that would be effective in the gum. There are some conventional products that are, and if anyone's interested, I can tell you what they are, but I'm not sure I'm supposed to do that on, on an organic webinar, but there's some of the, if you're a conventional grower, they're the ones you're familiar with that are effective as sprays. So the economics of it would definitely be interesting. Uh, we don't know how much it costs yet because they haven't, it's not, hasn't, finish the registration project process, but that would definitely be interesting. It would be more, as far as the entrust component, that would be much more economical than spraying entrust because you put a very small amount of entrust mixed with the, with the uh, gel. That's one of the main advantages of an attractant kill is you're using a much smaller amount of the insecticide product and you're attracting the insect to that product product so but yeah the economics questions will definitely be something that we'll address once it's for sale and we know how much it costs okay thank you we had some helpful um, attendees putting in some um, information about netting um, this one i don't think appeared in the chat i can copy it um, Someone Farouk put in that TechNet 80 gram may be used as exclusion netting, and uh, Laura put in a link to a berry 
protection solution supplier. Um, so yeah, someone wanted me to go back to the resources slide. So let me just do that. And I did put the link to the um, survey in the chat box. So um, we have a couple more questions about the gum. Um, can you talk about how to uh, use it? Hey, yes, it's always me, Gabriela. Uh, I, I can briefly talk about the use of uh, this technology. But the question is important, and it's important to understand how to use it. So, um, the gum is uh, just a substrate. So, um, right now, it's a cotton pads, you know, the cotton you use to clean your, your face. And on top of it, uh, we just put our attractant. And um, the way we use it, and we have done uh, many, many trials, not just here in Oregon, but uh, um, in many other uh, places from California, uh, in Italy, and you know, thanks to also our collaborators here in Georgia, Michigan, and so on, you need to place 50, 50 dispenser per acres. The radius of tractancy is uh, uh, 20 feet. And um, because of this, uh, we are talking about 50 dispenser per acre. So what you do, as soon as you have your decoy, your dispenser, you place it uh, on the ground in a shadow uh, place uh, under the irrigation system because uh, the mode of action is that um, when you receive, uh, when you have in your hand the pads, pads uh, it is dried, right? Uh, but as soon as uh, you start uh, uh, having it uh, watered by, by the irrigation system, uh, there is a volatile release. And you don't need a lot of water. We are talking about uh, five, six minutes per day. It would be better to run the water during the early morning or late afternoon while we have a, a higher number of flies moving around. And because of, because of this process, you can have volatiles going around. Uh, we, our data show us that you create a sort of a cloud of volatiles which interfere with the natural attractancy towards berries. And thanks to which uh, you, you get, uh, you get uh, your, um, uh, you, you can deal with flies. I see here, Luis asking if it's, it's organic. Yes, it's just organic stuff. And uh, it's, it's really easy, it's biodegradable. So it's meant that you just place once and uh, uh, for three weeks, uh, we saw that uh, also our collaborators, independent collaborators show us that uh, it can work in between two, three weeks and uh, generally three weeks. Uh, and after that, uh, you, you just need to place new one. Uh, you don't need to get them out from the feed because uh, you just organic stuff that uh, it disappeared uh, in uh, four, four, four or five weeks. Uh, so it's really easy to handle. It's really easy to place. Uh, it just need, and this is important to underline, a uh, um, few minutes of water every day. And only in this way you can have volatiles coming out and, uh, and uh, um, how to say, um, define a different behavior of, uh, of, of Drosophila suzukii. Yeah, so. Uh, this is it, 50 dispenser per acre, uh, 20 feet at least of uh, distances each, each of other, and a few drops, a few drops of water per day, and this is all that you need, uh, nothing more. It might be really helpful to have a fact sheet on how to use this. Yeah, um, this yeah, you're right. And, uh, publish it on the your organic website. I would love to, to do that because I think that would be really helpful for everyone. Ellis, you made a really good point. I want to clarify here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we published this very comprehensive uh, uh, extension bulletin that has information on all aspects of organic management of SWD in uh, organic bent in berry crops. It's, uh, on the current slide, there's a link that you can take, get a copy of this. Uh, we will uh, update this at the end of this project and we'll include that uh, information that you mentioned and other technologies that were uh, developed as part of this project and have that available to all stakeholders uh, at the end of this project. Oh yeah, um, can you talk about um, the effect of the attractant and interest on beneficials? Our work on uh, effects of uh, 
uh, and trust on beneficial insects uh, was was presented in uh, last year's webinar. If you can, uh, you can go visit, uh, uh, actually watch that webinar online for more details. But yes, uh, and trust had negative effects on beneficial insects. But if appl applied in in a, uh, a proper manner in the late in the evening or early in the morning to avoid more beneficial insect activity that can be minimized. Those negative inf impacts can be minimized. Okay, I can just go back and read out some of the ones that were um, already answered by typing in because I'm sure other people would be interested. Um, someone asked about the earliest time in the summer that um, spotted wind Drosophila would be seen on the east coast. And I'm sure that varies by region, but in south in the southeast, Ash said in Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina, they can be trapped year round. And in the northeast, flies can be captured in traps in late May and early June. So um, let's see. And then someone else asked, this is a great question. In the combination of weed mat and sawdust, is the sawdust on top of the weed mat or vice versa? So the, there are you put the uh, the weed mat on the top of the soda. So you have uh, your irrigation, drip irrigation to line running in, in the sawdust. So, and this is covered by the soda itself. And then on the top, you, you put your, uh, your um, weed mat uh, uh, plastic coverage. So generally it's like this. Sometimes we, there are uh, growers just using the sodas as is it, but uh, as uh, we were showing uh, previously in our slide, uh, when you have a combination of the two, uh, yes, yeah, so you, you have an initial higher cost, but actually then you're saving time and money because the plastic coverage uh, protects the, uh, the sawdust uh, in, uh, below. So you, you get um, better coverage and as we were saying, also good impact on, on the survival of Drosophila Suzuki. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there was another question about um, what the temperature from the mulches does to the egg mortality. And Gabriella had said that the higher temperature from the mulches increases the mortality of the juveniles. And um, then, um, then um, someone wanted to know why the mortality data um, that you showed didn't demonstrate better results um, for the mulches. And then Gabrielle said that they actually do. When you have sawdust or sawdust and weed mat, you increase the temperature on the ground and therefore you reduce the survival of the juvenile SWDs. Yeah, yeah. I, I contact him and we were able to chat a little bit. I show him again the pictures and I guess that now we, we define better together, you know, what he wanted to know more. So, yes. Yes. Is there any research about using LED lights to kill spotted wing Drosophila? That's a good question. We have not investigated the impact of LED lights in this project. So I, I won't be able to comment. If anybody else knows, please put in the, in the Q and A or chat box. That would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, and Vaughn said, um, Vaughn Walton, who was one of the researchers on this project typed in that um, constant light will lower egg laying. Um, have these studies incorporated smaller homestead size productions, such as 200 to 500 plants? Most of our research was conducted uh, in either initially in the lab and then in uh, research or commercial orchards. I don't know if any was conducted in the backyard, but findings are applicable to any setting uh, when scaled. So. And the response to earlier question about LED, Juan Walton did mention LED in pulses will lower the egg laying. This work was done uh, in Belgium. And then um, Kelly Hamby, who is also involved in this project as one of the researchers said that um, for sanitizers, they use jet ag in Maryland, blackberries, and similarly did not have sufficient fruit rot incidence to see differences. Um, and then someone suggests that Fumi Takeda with the USD ARS would be a good possible contact person for UV light efficacy on spotted wing Drosophila. Okay, I don't see any additional questions. 
Um, so I would like to thank everyone for all of these great questions. And um, I'd especially like to thank all the presenters for um, sharing your research with us today in this topic. So thanks to everyone for joining us.